Well, good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here with you guys, and I, I've been looking forward to this all through Christmas, and I love, love the Christmas trees and the wreath and everything. And I picked a Christmas text, so I'm just kind of relieved to, that we had some Christmas carols that uh, we're, all, we're all still in Christmas mode. So, um, But good morning. It's a pleasure to, to worship with you this morning, and... Uh, if you could turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and we'll all be on the same page, literally. Now, uh, as we get to uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, beginning of Luke's gospel, beginning of his Christmas story. I want to ask you guys a question. I want to ask you uh, if you would, uh, in this brand new year, want to meet its upcoming challenges with lesser, weaker faith, please raise your hand. Okay. No takers. Okay. Now, if in this brand new year with its new joys and trials that are coming, uh, you desire stronger, greater faith, please raise your hand. Well, fortunately for us, there's one more present left under the tree to unwrap. And I call it certainty under the tree. So let's read Luke and his gospel. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to be fed from your word. We come before you to have our faith strengthened. We come before you to, to worship you, knowing that your son really is the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, uh, we build our faith on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. Lord, we thank you for all of uh, the opportunities you've given us in this past year to, to see your faithfulness, to see your goodness, and to see your kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, for walking with us through all of our joys and sorrows this year. And we thank you for the prospect of a new year, uh, a brand new year to uh, present to you as a canvas for you to paint uh, your glory on. We love you so much, Lord. We pray that today this word would sustain us and, and feed us and, and nurture us. And we thank you for uh, being here with us this morning. We pray that you would uh, give me the ability to speak uh, what you would have me say. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to each of us the, the conviction and the, the, the power of knowing that your word is true and is certain. We love you, Savior, and, and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Theophilus, that's not one of those names that people usually name their kids from the Bible. They usually stick with the the short, you know, monosyllabic names, you know, Mark, Luke, John, you know, you don't have too many Theophiluses running around, but it's a beautiful name. It means lover of God. And so as you guys are reading this message originally intended for Theophilus, remember that it is intended for you as a lover of God to be instructed to know that this teaching is, is true. It's certain. So Luke writes to Theophilus 
at both the beginning of his gospel and the Christmas story that his purpose is that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, in John's gospel, he has a very similar statement. He says in John 20, 31, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Faith is not only our initial response to God, but our ongoing walk of trust in the Lord, built up by the truth of God's word. So if we want a, a stronger faith, we need to nurture it on the truth of God's word. Now, is it possible to have certainty about all of Scripture's teachings? Luke certainly seems to think so. Now, unbelievers might disagree, but sadly, so might too many Christians. And I say too many because even one person who has been purchased by the blood of Christ, who dishonors the Lord's character through doubt in His Word, is too many. So my goal in this sermon is to challenge each of you to build up your faith this year by standing standing firm on the certainty of God's Word. And in this way, not only will we affirm God's truthful character, but we will also put our faith into action by not being conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our mind. And so we will glorify God. Now three natural questions arise from this. First off, why can we have certainty? Second, well, why is this even important? And third, what does it look like to have it? So let's talk about that first question. Why can we have certainty about the teaching of God's word? How does Luke answer? Well, one word in verse 2 goes a long way. Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. And what are the eyewitnesses of? Verse 1, the things that have been accomplished among us. Verse 2 also points to an ongoing process that Luke continues for both Theophilus and us, and that is the transmission of God's Word. So let's start there. So, basically, breaking it down, God does something, eyewitnesses see it, and then their witness is passed on to others. And ultimately, it becomes embodied in Scripture. So, when you are opening your Bible and you're hearing it read in church or you're picking it up and reading it before bed or in the morning, you are picking up essentially an eyewitness account of what God has done. You're coming face to face with um, a deposition of, of truth. You're hearing somebody give their testimony about what they saw. Now, in a court of law, once a witness is sworn in, their witness must be tr presumed true and compelling unless the prosecutor um, can demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that their witness is not consistent. And so, when you hear somebody give their witness, unless there's a really good reason to believe that they're lying and, and that can be prosecuted, the, the, the burden of proof lies um, in the favor of the witness. Their witness must be presumed true and compelling. So obviously then, the greater the number of witnesses that agree, it, it becomes even more consistent and compelling. So in the same way, Luke, here in Luke 1, 2, he's talking about how there were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word who have delivered this message to the first century church. People like Luke, who were not, uh, Luke was not a, a original, you know, one of the 12. Um, he was one of the only 
Uh, he's the only Gentile to write a book of Scripture. But he was able, from hearing other people's eyewitness accounts, to know that what he was taught about Jesus was true. And in Luke 1 2, it's just like other biblical passages, such as Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 3 through 8, where he's talking about witnesses to the resurrection. There were over 500 witnesses, Paul says, and many of them uh, at the time Paul wrote that in 1 Corinthians. If you were to go and travel to Israel at that time, you could go and talk to them about what they saw. Um, John in 1 John 1, 1 through 4 talks about what we have seen, what we have handled. You know, we, we touched the Son of God. Um, it refers to the fact that there were many witnesses. The multiplicity of the witnesses and the reliability of their record. So according to legal standards, Luke's message is reliable and it's supported by not just a few eyewitnesses, but many eyewitnesses. But what do they witness to? The things that have been accomplished among us. This points not only to actions God has completed, but which also have been authenticated by being foretold in the Old Testament. I love that. People saw things that, they, that God had told them they were going to see, and then they were witnesses to the fact that it had happened. These prophetic events after being foretold, then happened, becoming a matter of historical record, as much as the Battle of Hastings in 1066 or the Gettysburg Address. But God does not rely only on eyewitnesses. He sets his seal on specific ones so that for us to believe their witness is to believe his witness. So God not only went to the trouble of foretelling what was going to happen, then arranging for there to be many witnesses to see it. But he sets a seal on specific eyewitnesses so that for us to believe them is to believe what he is saying. Think about it. Luke says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative. Yet, there's only four authoritative gospels in Scripture. So, other people were writing these things down. And their, their witnesses were true insofar as uh, what they were saying reflected what they had seen. But we know from 1 Corinthians 15 that 500 plus were eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection. Now, if these people had written down their firsthand accounts, all 500 plus of them, these would have been true and compelling. They would have been true. But God selected certain writers to record his word. He doesn't ask us to read 500 gospels. He just asks us to read four. And these books became part of the Bible, consistent with and fulfilling the Old Testament. So this brings us to the heart of the matter. God has provided many eyewitnesses, but he gives us certain eyewitnesses, certain people who are giving not just what they've seen, but this is what God wants you to know. So there's an eyewitness component to the truth of God's word, that people whose senses work just like yours and mine experience these as realities. But there's also the component of this is God's revelation. This is what God wants you to know authoritatively. We should believe in the certainty of Scripture's teaching regarding anything it touches because it is God's word backed by his omniscience and his integrity. That is, his, the fact that God knows everything and he cannot lie. So as Paul writes in Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. And what this means is that when sinful, imperfect, and limited human perception disagrees with God's word, it's to be disregarded. It also means that God's word is enough to compel and demand our obedient belief. By virtue of God saying 
something, we are compelled to believe it. Now, some Christians struggle with this apparent circular reasoning. Let me get this straight, somebody might say. I'm supposed to believe the Bible because the Bible tells me to? It does, does on the face of things, sound a little circular. But what happens if you were to put another source of authority behind it? I'm supposed to believe X because of Y. And you could put a whole bunch of different things in there. Say archaeology or science or history, philosophy, etc. It might, on the face of things, seem more reasonable. But the problem with this is that an appeal to authority implies a higher authority than what the appeal came from. If I'm appealing from a position down here to a higher authority, then really what the authority is coming from is not down here, but the thing that I appealed to. And in the case of God's word, there's nothing higher than God's word. God's word, has, there's no higher authority to appeal to. So true, outside witnesses often confirm it, but they do not confer authority upon it. Scripture thus does not require external witnesses, but it does provide internal witness. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that you know when God's talking to you. You know when God wants you to do something. Take Zechariah and Mary later on in this chapter. How did, how did they react when they saw the angel? They, they knew that they were face to face with a representative of God. And when people see an angel in the Bible, it seems like they always, the angel always has to say something like, don't be afraid, you know, calm down. They don't have to convince their hearers of their credentials. And in the same way, when God's word convicts or edifies us, even if we're resistant to the message because we don't want it to be true, it's getting in the way of something we really want to hold on to, well, we still know that God is talking to us. So ultimately, we can have certainty regarding Scripture. God provides eyewitnesses. He not only provides eyewitnesses, but he speaks in an authoritative way in his word. And then finally, he gives us an internal witness inside us through the Holy Spirit's work. Now, if you believe God's word, man, you do well. And God, God will reward you. Every time that we, we take in God's word and we say, yes, Lord, thank you. And we feed on it and we let it nourish us and uh, we're letting God love us. And, and the amazing thing about God is that uh, even though out of his mercy he's already loving us, he then, when we are obedient, gives us the further mercy of giving us a reward for something that was only possible because of him in the first place. Kind of like when parents give their, their kids um, uh, money to buy Christmas presents. You know, that, that, was a, a, that was a blessing that the parent provided. Um, and it's only possible because of that mercy in the first place. Well, when you, uh, aside from anything external that is in the nature of a blessing, your understanding of God and his word will grow. And even more important, you will grow more attentive to hearing God. It's just like anything else. When you listen to God in his word, you start noticing, hearing his voice. Uh, you're you're going to know what he wants you to do. But if you choose not to, just like everyone else, at the end of your life, you will find yourself face to face with the Lord Jesus at his judgment seat, explaining why you called his father a liar by refusing to believe. Please understand that even those who have been saved will still have to answer for every thought, word, and deed done in the flesh. Now, 
Christ covers every sin that we do with His blood when we believe in Him. But we're still going to have a long chat with Him about everything that we did. And uh, there's a lot more that we could go into. That's a whole sermon all by itself. I simply want to point out that this matters because ultimately we are held accountable. Uh, you know, we can so easily avoid things that seem like disagreements uh, or, you know, we just want to avoid getting into squabbles with people. So we're like, ah, it doesn't really matter. You know, I'll just go on over here. You go on over there. But ultimately, um, when we approach God's word and we hear it and we, we turn away from it, we're going to have to give account of that to the Lord, uh, both, both non-believers and believers. And that won't make a, an, a believer lose their salvation, but can you imagine being face-to-face -face with Jesus and knowing that, knowing that you, you dishonored him? It would be painful. It would be very painful. And this is why Christ teaches that of those who have been given much, much will be expected. When we receive instructions from God's Word, we are accountable for what we do with it. And this doesn't need to make us be afraid because if we take God's Word to heart and obey, we will bear much fruit and have a reward to look forward to. It's just like the parable of the, the talents. You know, the people who who went out and did something, no matter what they did with it, even if it only came back with five talents, you know, that was just great. It was the, the person who buried the talent in the ground and did nothing with it who received scorn. So we can see from the fact that we're accountable to the Lord Jesus himself for what we do with his word, that this is important stuff. And I think that that goes a long way to answer our second question, which is, why does this matter to me? Well, because when you hear God's word, God has given you something powerful. He's given you something meaningful. And if you were to receive something as important and life-giving as the word of God, and then you were to bury it in the ground and do nothing with it, you're going to be accountable for that. So that's why it's important. But there's more to it than that. Uh, you are being motivated by the knowledge that, um, that Paul gets to in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, people disagreeing about things in the Bible did not start in the 21st century or the 20th century or the 19th century. It started in the first century. And Paul was responding to people who went to church, who uh, looked just like everybody else who was going to church, and people who said, you know what, I really like going to this church, this is my paraphrase, but you know, there really is no such thing as the resurrection. And um, Paul, I don't see why you make such a big point of this. It seems, you know, kind of a little... A little, uh, you know, beneath our, our, beneath us to put this emphasis on the the afterlife when we could perhaps be doing important things today. Well, did that sort of thing cease back in Paul's day? No, it, it continues on. People might take a look at this doctrine or that doctrine and say, "Well, this really kind of seems, you know, unnecessary to us today in the 21st century." Do you think that? Um, People taking their mental scissors to their Bibles whenever they feel embarrassed or inconvenienced by certain teachings. You think that ceased back in Paul's day after Paul wrote his initial response to that? No, it continues today. People continue to think, oh, I sure wouldn't want to talk to this uncle or, or this friend from high school about this 
They just laughed to my face. Well, pay attention to how Paul responds because it's the same answer to us when we're tempted to say, you know, I can get along just fine as a Christian without believing that. Which we're tempted to do every day. Paul points out that ultimately, if you take away the resurrection, the doctrine they claimed wasn't necessary, you took away the gospel. You took away salvation because you took away Christ's resurrection. In Paul's words, their faith was futile and they were still in their sins if they were being logically consistent. So often we as Christians, we want to be taken seriously. We want to be liked. We don't want to be disliked or, or uh, look foolish to people out in the world. We want to be taken seriously. So in a desire to save an inconsistent secular idea that clearly contradicts Scripture, um, we so often imperil our faith and make our thinking inconsistent with Scripture. Now, as I said before, this does not mean that we will lose our salvation if we err in biblical teaching. But it does mean that we will be held accountable for our errors And we'll also be held accountable for the inevitable wrong actions that will come as a result of believing wrong teaching. See, Scripture's teaching is not just aesthetic. It's not just a matter of, oh, I like blue Christmas lights, but I like white twinkly lights. It's it's a matter of the fact that right teaching results in right living. And people all the time will say, well, if right living is what matters, then... The teaching isn't necessary. No. You'll find that people inevitably follow what they consider to be true. There's really nothing... The the rails that hold you along the track of life is what's in here, what's in here. And if you go off the rails that God has provided, uh, the right living that you say that you have is not right living to God. And you'll be held accountable for those actions. You'll be held accountable for the dishonor you brought to God by saying with your life that you knew better than Him. But it doesn't even end there because your cool, confident disobedience was almost certain to have brought confusion to someone who was vulnerable, whose conscience was weak, whose faith might have been timid, and you will be held accountable for that too. And so you can see that God in his word is saying, believe, because all of these rewards, all of these good things follow believing my word. But all of these bad things (laughs) are going to result from you not holding on. Just trust me. Trust me. And even as I prepared that this prepared this message this week, I thought how often I am tempted to to bow to the pressure of the world. How often I as a Christian am, am tempted to want to be taken seriously by worldly people. And I had to throw myself humbly before God in prayer so often as I prepared this message. As I saw my own temptation, my own weakness asking that he would help me to be faithful to his teaching and that his spirit would strengthen me to obey. And that is my same prayer for you. Candidly, uh, some of my uh, dear people, uh, dear friends, uh, have been struggling. Uh, and um, I see their faith being tested. And, and we all know Maybe it's a son or a daughter. Maybe it's a friend in high school. Maybe it's uh, a coworker. We just wish we could get in the game for them and do what we know they need to do. But just like a coach, you've got to let them play the game. You've got to let them figure it out for themselves. And so as we, as we realize how, how much we need God's help, we need to be praying for them, praying that that God would strengthen their faith, that they would know 
what Luke went out of his way to establish at the beginning. You can trust this. This is real. God wants you to know that you can completely rely on this. So, perhaps it will help us to remember that God has a purpose for everything in Scripture, and it all goes to support Scripture's great message, the Gospel. Now, think of Scripture as a thick sweater knit from one single, continuous skein of yarn. And on a day like today, I think this illustration will go a long way. So, somebody, so this is, it's important to remember in this illustration, this, this, you know, some amazing lady has made the sweater because this sounds really hard to do. Um, and some of you knitters out there might know just how hard this is to do, but one single piece of yarn. Okay. Now somebody picks at a thread here, snips away at an end there that's sticking out. And pretty soon, like in the Weezer song, uh, somebody's holding on to that thread, you're walking away, and you're left out in the cold. <laughs> so in the same way, the Bible is not just 66 books. Oh, you know what? We're just fine here with these 23 over here. We like the New Testament, that Old Testament stuff, man. We just don't get it. No, it's, it's all there. It's one book with 66 chapters. And what it says about creation, what it says about the making of man in God's image as a special creation, what it says about the, the literal fall, all are central to the same thread that leads us to understand ourselves as fallen people, estranged from our Creator, uh, desperately in need of the sinless Son of God who has become a human being in order to take away our sins and God's anger at them. Risen again to show that his sacrifice has been accepted. Ultimately, God wants you to place your faith in his son, to be your savior, so that you will enjoy eternal life with him forever. So this leads us to our final question, the practical angle. So hopefully at this point, you know that you can have certainty in God's word, because there's eyewitnesses. God's said it's authoritative, and there's an inner witness that says, believe this. You're supposed to, to trust those witnesses. Hopefully you know this is important because we'll all be held accountable for this and what, it, what, our, what we do with it uh, what matters. But what does it look like? Okay, what does it look like to do this? Well, fortunately, Luke gives us two examples almost right away in this first chapter of what it looks like to have certainty. And he gives us an example of somebody doing it not that great, <laughs> not very well, and then he shows us somebody who does it. And we need to be like that. So Zechariah, I love this scene. It's one of, the, one of my favorite uh, parts of the Christmas story. Zechariah, in this very dramatic scene, he's serving God in the temple. He's been a priest his whole life. He has a long career as a priest. He's serving God in the temple. And something that has never happened to him before happens. This archangel Gabriel appears with a very special message. And they go through the whole, don't be afraid, I'm an angel, listen to what I have to say, routine. And he finds out that his wife Elizabeth, who's past childbearing age, will have a son. And that this son will prepare the way for the Messiah. In fact, he's going to be the Messiah's cousin. So how does Zechariah, a lifelong priest, skilled in knowing the word of God, uh, respond? Well, even though he should have known better, he questions the angel's message. Are you sure about that? That doesn't really sound possible, possible to me. She's, she's way too old to have that happen. Uh, well, in his human understanding, it just didn't add up, despite the fact that I'm sure at least once in his life he'd read the story of Abraham and Sarah before. And he didn't believe God's good news because he put his human understanding of what was possible as a filter over God's word. He wasn't able to speak a word then until the prophecy came true. And I believe that one possible reason for this silence 
I was thinking about this. Why, why was his punishment being silent? Well, I think one reason might be is that it kind of served to show that he had been deaf to God's voice. God had spoken to him. He didn't really listen. And so now nobody could listen to him. It kind of served to underscore his deafness to God's voice. And that's an example of what certainty isn't. Now, as you see, uh, John still was born. He went on to be the father of, you know, the one who came in the spirit of Elijah. But um, that's, that just wasn't, that's not how it's supposed to be. Then there's Mary. Compared to Zechariah's situation, she was told something that must have seemed practically impossible. Okay. Uh, on the one hand, yeah, um, in the Bible, old women have had babies before. It doesn't happen very often, but you know what? God's done it before. He can do it again. Well, compared to Zechariah's situation, she was told something that must have seemed practically impossible uh, to anybody with a working knowledge of the birds and the bees. The same angel told her that she would bear God's son to be named Jesus, who would be the Messiah, even while she was a virgin. Now Mary had a clarifying question. Um, Perhaps because there had never been a uh, parallel to this before, her question reflected not doubt, but honest curiosity. And listen to the angel's reply that will satisfy you also. Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. So what do you say when your, your kid or... Uh, your coworker, or an unbelieving friend challenges you on one of these teachings. Same thing that the angel said. Nothing will be impossible with God. See, it goes back to God's character, doesn't it? In the end, God wants us to trust him because he's made his character known, that we can trust him. And so no matter what he tells us, it's not impossible. We can learn so much from Mary. She was a nobody from Nazareth. She wasn't a lifelong priest who knew her scriptures backwards and forwards. But like Abraham before her, she did not stagger in unbelief at God's promise. And as we follow the continuous thread of God's salvation message through scripture, let's put God's character as the filter on our understanding and not the other way around. We all live in an age in which we kind of understand, you know, with taking pictures on our phones, how filters work. Well, the filter that we have to put over our own perceptions is God's character. We know that God will not lie to us. We know that he's trustworthy. We know that he knows everything. We know that nothing is impossible for him. We can ask questions of God's word. We can study it. We can learn just like Mary did. She asked questions. We can sit for years maybe with the text before God illumines it for us, provided that we begin our inquiries with perfect trust in God's character and therefore his word. Expect your human understanding to snag on disagreements with secular thought because your fallen nature's inclination is to resist God's word and prefer vain philosophy. But if you let that inclination have its head, you will soon be riddled with doubts. And as we talked about what happens when you don't believe God's word, we know why we don't want that. But when you encounter difficulties after resolving to always believe God's word as a matter of principle, because you know that God's character is a firm foundation, then you will find that faith will help you to crest the wave of not understanding until, like for Mary, the pieces fall into place and it is presented to your mind as an answered question. Understanding does not lead to faith because faith is a personal trust in God's character. I want to say that one more time. Understanding does not lead to faith because faith is a personal trust in God's character. We will never know all that God knows because we will never be God. And so we can never evaluate everything that God says 100% and then say, I trust you. But and the little understanding that we do have is riddled with sin. It's riddled with limitations. But 
despite our limited sinful understanding, we can trust God's character. And all the time we find that the reverse does happen, that faith does lead to understanding, that as we believe something, light is shed on something. God reveals something to us that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Maybe somebody, after you believe and and people have laughed at you, somebody digs up evidence of a king all the experts said didn't exist because they knew the Bible was true and they would not be wasting their time to be digging in the sand looking there. But the real reward is not knowledge, but the delightful discovery that as we trust in God, our trust grows and we deepen in our knowledge and love for him. Like Mary this year, may your trust in God's character give you certainty that will result in great glory to God. Great fruitfulness in your life and great encouragement to the faith of your brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's pray.